we're about halfway loaded. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andrea Joseph. Welcome to the University of Tennessee's College of Social Work Social Justice Podcast. This event has been made possible by the College's Office for Equity and Inclusion. Um, again, my name is Andrea Joseph McCatty, and I am an assistant professor here in our college. Um, our previous episodes for the Social Justice Podcast have covered the issue of disproportional school suspensions of Black girls um, and how policymakers, school social workers, and educators can help to mitigate that outcome. So today we'll be discussing something a bit different, but deeply connected to social justice and social work practice specifically. So this is why we are bringing this topic here to you, because we have found it is under discussed and we want to continue to elevate this topic. So the topic at hand today for our social justice podcast is weight bias. Perhaps you've also heard it know, um, called as fat phobia or weight stigma. Uh, weight stigma is discrimination, stereotyping, and bias based on someone's weight. Fat phobia, however, or in addition, refers to the irrational fear of aversion to or discrimination against fatness. So before I go any further, I would love for our um, our, my, our guests and our panelists members, our students to introduce themselves. And we're gonna start with Eva. Alrighty, hi everybody. My name is Eva. My pronouns are she, her. I am in my entering my final semester as a grad student at the UT College of Social Work. I'm on the clinical or the evidence-based interpersonal track. And I am obtaining a certification in trauma treatment. I'm currently working are interning at the Sexual Assault Center. And in my spare time, I have a project called Mood Collective, which is working to decolonize the wellness industry and create space for people of color and wellness. Hi, I'm Megan Moss and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm also a UT social work grad student doing the clinical track and enrolled in the trauma certification. And I'm hoping to do clinical practice with populations that experience systemic weight discrimination. And something else that I want to share with you is that my preferred size descriptor is fat. And fat is a term that's been reclaimed by fat activist communities. And I like this descriptor because it doesn't pathologize my body like words um, like overweight and obese, which are considered pejorative to a lot of fat communities. Um, and then I also just want to say that I have a podcast called Nobody Asked for This that is about this whole topic. So check it out if you want to. And Bryn was a guest in one season. Um, so today we want to explore why we as social workers need to understand weight bias. The NASW Code of Ethics lists social justice as a core value, stating social, works per social workers pursue social change particularly with and on behalf of vulnerable and oppressed individuals and groups of people. Social workers' social change efforts are focused primarily on issues of poverty, unemployment, discrimination, and other forms of social injustice. These activities seek to promote sensitivity to and knowledge about oppression and cultural and ethnic diversity. But what about weight bias? Weight bias is so embedded in our society that it often goes unchallenged and left unchecked, weight bias has contributed to discriminatory practice and negative psychosocial effects on community members. And we are so excited to have you, Bryn, here. So please, will you introduce yourself for everyone to get to know you? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Bryn Plummer. And I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, but I spent a lot of time in Knoxville. Um, my title, my full-time job is I'm the Vice President of Equity, Inclusion, and Community at a startup incubator called the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. It's a similar center in Knoxville called no the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center. Um, and I also facilitate uh, conversations in the workplace, primarily in strategy and marketing creative agencies around diversity, equity, and inclusion, all the different situations that might come to bear in their workplace or in their work. Um, my preferred pronouns, so um, I can also model all the amazing things that I'm seeing here are she, her, 
and Megan, I love the the narrative that you shared around why your preferred language or about your body is fat. Similarly, my preferred language is fat as well. Um, and I'm grateful to be here with you all and share the airspace. Great, thank you all for your introductions. And this is about to be a great conversation. So um, our first question for you, Bryn, is um, what type of uh, discrimination do you feel that fat folks experience on a systemic level? I think, um, well, I think there's an I think, and that's kind of more in my body and what I see, and then there's of course the we know and the mm -hmm. facts and, and statistics that are out there. So I think weight stigma is something that is much more pervasive and unseen than people realize. So uh, for example, I recently conducted a session with an architecture firm and uh, specifically it was around diversity, equity, inclusion. I think we came in with a lens of race, gender, uh, how do we equalize the experience of people here in this place? Um, but just as someone who was advocating for myself and thinking about these, this architecture firm and the spaces they were gonna go create, I just spent a good chunk of time thinking about, uh, you all are gonna design a bunch of restaurants. Here's this chair that I continue to see in fancy restaurants in town that is absolute trash for no. fat people. So it's this one chair that every hip restaurant has that is horrible. Uh, so think about your seating, thinking about your, uh, the space between things, thinking about, uh, and I think also fatness in that regard is a dimension of ability as well and ableism. So thinking about how can people access things and how do we make it possible for people in more bodies to access things and the test population for, uh, for spaces and places to be more than just a, a standard body. And I'm putting standard in quotation marks if someone is listening and not watching. Um, so those are the things that I, I kind of experience and know in my body and know from friends and family who are also fat and experience that. And then what we know uh, statistically is that weight stigma is pervasive at pretty much every level of society and everything we interact with. So weight stigma exists in, oh, there's my little dog. Weight stigma exists at the doctor's office. And I think a lot of people can relate to this going into a doctor for let's say a broken ankle or a cold or whatever. And the doctor asking about your weight or suggesting that weight loss is a part of that regardless of what the, the issue is. So weight stigma happens at the medical, uh, happens in the medical field. It happens at work. We know that fat people are more likely to be described as lazy or seen as lazy. They're less likely to uh, achieve promotions at the same pace as their thinner peers. Uh, they're more likely to be uh, regarded as less intelligent than their thinner body peers. And so um, that has implications, not just on, it's not just about feeling bad about yourself, which I think a lot of times in the wellness and this, this new age of in, uh, commercialized self-care, it's about feeling good about yourself. We're not just talking about feeling good about your body because I can feel good about my body all day or neutral mm -hmm. about my body. It's not going to change how my body interacts with these structures. It's not going to interact, uh, change necessarily how those structures interact with me. It, it has material impact on our lives as fat people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Um, it makes me think about agronomics in general. You know, when um, industrial organizational psychologists, you know, design sort of workspaces that are supposed to be functional for the body, right? Um, to be relaxed and comfortable and good for your back, for example, right? But it sounds like um, what you're saying, when I think about weight bias as a systemic level, is like whose body is standardized for ergonomics, right? Whose body are we consistent yes. when we make, you know, like you said, chairs, whose bodies are we considering? Um, and so that makes that makes so much sense to me. And, you know, what you've said about the way that this shows up sort of in the medical field seems super, you know, super important for all of us to, to, to understand. Because I recall seeing something about a woman who'd had serious um, ailments. And every time mm -hmm. she went to the doctor, the doctor is like, it's your weight, lose some weight. She yes. loses weight and she's still having the issues and yep. comes to but she had this serious underlying health condition that had nothing to do with her weight. Absolutely. Right? So Absolutely. there goes the bias. She was denied access to the correct medical treatment. Absolutely. And we've codified weight stigma. We've made it okay to practice weight stigma in almost every space mm -hmm. <laughs> in our work, in our in our working world, right? So yeah. I mean, I think anyone who's been a part of the, the workforce has known. There have been times in the workforce where people have had like way down challenges or uh, walking challenges and things like that would be, it's not necessarily about getting healthier or, you know, it might be about getting healthier, but it's coded as way less. So you are less costly to be ensuring of you for your employer uh, and or so you're just like less uh, unappealing to look at to your peers. But also um, 
it also intersects with um, the standardization given the way that the standard body in the US context has changed so much and so quickly, there's something about the standardization that is not reflective of reality that persists because we, what's standard in America is not what is seen as the standard in workplaces, uh, in, the, in the image of what a standard body is, a standard body, if you think of like an average person right now, is not reflective of the actual average in our society. So in, in the way that that standardization has worked, it also makes it okay for us to discriminate against fat people, but it also makes invisible all the people uh, and that's small fats, super fats, always fats. Uh, it makes us invisible um, because that person that we're matching in our mind is the standard, it's like a size eight, when we know the size standard now is about a 16, 18. So we're making invisible a number of people who are actually within the standard range on, on both sides. And so um, this unreality to me is reflective not of an actual concern for fat people, but of a pathology that has idolized thinness uh, and has equated thinness to goodness, thinness to smartness, thinness to worthiness. Um, that is frankly just damaging to um, most people that we know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, including ourselves most of the time. Right, so you make me think a lot about the me our medical community, right? Um, and generally we use BMI as a standard to discuss mm -hmm. one sort of height and weight ratio. And I'm sure maybe some of our listeners or future listeners are gonna say, hey, you can't beat science. Science tells us what's healthy and what's not. So yeah. what's your perspective on that? One, love science. This is a great opportunity to trash science. Um, <laughs> Science sometimes is science, right? I feel like in this, I don't want to malign science in this age of just debating facts as if we, <laughs> as if that's what we're doing. Um, I don't want to malign science for the sake of maligning science, but there's science and then there's, uh, science exists in the context of culture. And it's very, very um, pervasive throughout the history of science to advance the wants and needs and desires of the body politic regardless of what the science is, right? So this science was created uh, in the 18th, 17th, 18th, sorry, 18th, 19th century body mass index to essentially make it possible to classify people. Well, why was it that people were wanting to classify people in the 1800s? Huh, that's really interesting. What was going on in society to classify people? We know that almost any time that society has made major pushes to classify people, it's to justify the oppression of people. What's more, body mass index um, was taken with a really small sample size. It is, to me, it's about the same level of pseudoscience as something like phrenology, this debunked science that said the shape of your head told you things about your personality. Um, so it's about on that, on that par to me. Now, is it, just think about it for a second. Is it, does it even make sense that someone could take your height and take your weight and decide how much body fat you have? Like, are our skeletons different? Are our muscle tissues different? Are our fat, like that doesn't even make any sense. Um, what's more, the populations that it was derived from were not inclusive of all the different people and bodies and ways that we express um, body fat and adipose tissue across cultures and across different um, times in, in culture. So it is one of those things that's been debunked many times, but it is often used at, by the medical system to help understand how to deliver someone's treatment. It's used to determine uh, someone's cost of insurance. Uh, if you're going to pursue any kind of life insurance or anything like that, it's oftentimes used as this measuring stick that doesn't really benefit anyone. There's really no benefits to anyone. Even if you have a small body mass index, there's not really a medical benefit to you to have a small body mass index. Um, it really is just used as the people that classify us in order to figure out how much it costs to insure us and all those different things um, can put us in a box and classify us. Uh, it is also one of those things that I think is used to make it easier for people who don't want to believe that weight is a part of one's identity. A lot of people who will just say, well, just if you don't wanna be weight stigmatized, lose weight. Um, I think it's also used as a way to justify the treatment of people who are fat to say, you know, you know your BMI, you know your stats, like, this is the range you should be aiming for. Why don't you just do it? Um, 
and as a way to make it, you know, stigmatize that a person's height and weight might be out of alignment with what they think it needs to be. So it's it's kind of um it's one of those things that's kind of chasing the tail. Like, what does society want from BMI? What is BMI trying to do to society? Uh, does it actually make anyone healthier? No. Does it correlate with healthfulness? No. Does it correlate at all with the behaviors? Uh, that we see for people. No, there aren't any things that people with a BMI 20 do that are categorically different from what people at a BMI 50 do that are categorically different. There's much more variety within group. So, um, but it is one of those things that people really hang on to. And we also have to remember too that in our society, like fat phobia as a health scare is very ready. I think is very ready. We're very ready in time for it. Thinking about how big the biggest loser was for years and years and years even though we knew, uh, I could never watch it, but if anyone did watch it, you're like, oh, this is really, uh, this is abuse um, that's being portrayed as a, a good thing because it's helping these people quote unquote get healthy. Um, and I don't think there's really anything on the other side of abuse that you ends up being helpful for the most part. I can't think of anything on the other side of abuse that's like, oh, this is a good outcome for the most part. You know, Obviously there's aberrations all the time. Right, right. You know, and, and something you say, you know, I, as you speak, I want to ask you, what does all of this say about, at least in the U.S., you know, sort of um, our continuing to co-sign weight bias? Like, what does that say about our culture um, and our, our thoughts about weight, right? Because I think, you know, while in the U.S. we're still working to address many forms of bias and discrimination, I feel that, um, and I've heard other people say that weight bias is one of those long-standing biases that often go unchecked, right? So what does that say about our culture? It says all the things that all the other isms say about our culture, right? Which is that we're very sick. <laughs> we're very unwell. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know ourselves. We don't respect a, heart, a huge portion of who is part of our body, and I say body is in terms of the entire composition of our nation. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have this, I think you can't disaggregate the kind of puritanical roots of our country. I said work, work, labor, um, were the path to godliness and ascension, idle hands, pleasure, indulgence, that's the path to uh, danger and hell. I don't think you can separate those things from weight bias um, and how it exists today. So I think there is something to, it's the same reason I think we idolize supermodels. And I think that's the same reason why we idolize certain bodies. It's why Kamel Nanjiani's transformation kind of transfix us. You know, um, there is a striving in this culture to be something that is unattainable and potentially to be something that is a reflection of a fantasy that is unhealthy um, and also a fantasy that doesn't have a material impact on our lives most of the time. Like being thin has a material impact on promotions and things like that, but it doesn't say anything about your character. It doesn't say anything about what you have self-actualized. It doesn't say anything about the person you are. Um, and yet, because we associate hard work, discipline, all that with thinness, we also associate those things with the hard work and discipline that is related to morality from our puritanical beginnings. So it's all this kind of deep existential striving to be something that is in control. Um, and I also think there is a, I think in a lot of things in American culture, it is a preoccupation with staving off death, with staving off aging, with this belief that you can fight off if you work hard enough and are disciplined enough, you can save yourself from any kind of uh, negative health outcome, which is just not reality. Like you can work out every day and get hit by a bus, right? You can work out every day. And like, I walk an hour every day and I, my weight has not changed demonstrably. Uh, and I started doing that two years ago when I got a dog, my weight has not changed demonstrably since then. So like, clearly something is like, there's, this is who my body wants to be. Um, and so I think there is a striving that is part of American culture that is sometimes a good part of our culture, most of the core of us not, but it is at the core of it, it is existentially part of who we are. Um, and this idea of what it means to be American, I think is to be someone who is dedicated, hardworking, disciplined, and has control of their field and their environment. And that includes their body. 
Right, indeed. I just want to um, give attention to um, on Facebook Live. Um, somebody's made a comment, um, Donna D. She says the B, um, BMI gives me anxiety. I've always been um, categorized as obese since I've taken it. Since um, she says, I remember my first time doing it was in middle school that left a tough scar. And I just wanna say, Donna, like I can really empathize with you here because you've just brought a memory up for me. I remember being in middle school and we had these things called like fat calipers. And- um, Oh my God, I remember them. And you had to squeeze the side of your belly and you know squeeze like the side of your arm and write down your inches and things like that. And I remember when I did my, I followed the instructions for my um, categorization, I fell in the obese category as well. Now, the interesting thing is growing up, I never really thought or had a label about my size per se, although I would say I did experience a lot of um, early messages of being overweight when I was younger. And I remember in fifth grade, I I lost 20 pounds on my own because of negative things that like adults said. Wow. And so, wow. but now that I had this medical language of you're obese and I remember, and so Don, I really, you know, empathize with you about how that landed with me. And I, and I always felt ashamed in um, middle school or in school when in gym, we had to use these cal calipers, I believe they're called. And so, um, you know, there, there is a scarring that is left if we don't have conversation with people in context. And as you said, Bren, Bren you know, for example, <laughs> BMI does not count for muscle mass. How about that? It is made up. The man <laughs> who made it up mostly studied sociology and he described his pursuit of all of his, he also studied astronomy. And that dude was, I think if I think about him, what's a contemporary uh, analog, Connor Roy from Succession, if I have Succession fans out there just a student of life because they can't actually do anything. So it's shocking that this is, per, is still in our society. And he was mostly striving to understand what the societal ideal was. That was in, its true intention. And so we should always have questions for any person who is deciding what the societal ideal is because that is generally that person's motivations are suspect from the jump. Um, and I wanna thank Donna, I wanna thank Dr. Joseph for sharing their experiences because that's how most of us our early experiences around weight and BMI are exclusively pathologizing and anxiety inducing. Almost no one gets that number and is stoked. Or if they are stoked, it's because they've fallen into this incredibly narrow range that is not based on anything. Um, it's this constant goalpost moving. And I don't think we found, I have not heard anyone say what a positive outcome of the BMI scale is. I've not yet to hear one. I've only heard in doing research that it's debunked and also negatively impacting people of all sizes and, and shapes. Megan, were you about to say something? I feel like you were about to say something. Yeah, thank you. You're so attuned. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much, Donna. Was it Donna? for sharing that. I've heard that so many times from people, that story. Um, and also just to add about BMI, uh, in 1998, it was lowered overnight. And that was because there was a task force called the Obesity uh, Task Force. And they were influenced wow. by pharma who wanted to put out weight loss drugs. So overnight, people were ending up in categories that they weren't in before. So if that isn't a demonstration of how capitalism influences and biases science, I don't know what is. And also just the fact that the BMI has launched a thousand eating disorders. I don't think we can... Pass, right? over, pass over BMI without talking about that. Spot on. That, I mean, even as somebody who is has a mainstream body, like I will never forget at what, I mean, 10, which was probably around the time when they changed the BMI overnight. Like I was told that by a doctor that I was overweight and, um, and like that's, and I had to go through my own confusion as a mixed kid who's just has a different body than the average white child or whatever. And like my mom had to go through that with me. It was like, you have muscle mass. You are pure muscle, Eva. And you are, you have strong bones. And like, I'm like, what does that mean to a child? Right? Like that is such a weird, it's such a weird way. First of all, for so many people, there's so many other conversations about their body 
that are happening, good, bad, and different. Like think about your experience of your body up till then. You're trying new things. You're getting on equipment at the at the schoolyard. Most of the time, you're rewarded for new. You know, your parents get excited, or your family members, your community gets excited when you can do new things like hopscotch or double dutch or climb something. That's how your body is for the most part. Uh, unless, you know, you have, you know, if that's been your experience with your body and then all of a sudden you get this BMI number at 10, how do you make sense of any of that? Like for the most part, my body is this tool that I have to engage with the world. And then all of a sudden it has this number put on it. That's so weird. Um, and of course that is totally putting aside all the different messages we get about our bodies that are, uh, happening in our household all the time, primarily through what our adults in our household are saying about their own bodies. Um, so that is totally putting that aside. But when you think about your body as a tool and an instrument to engage with the world, and then you get this weird number to put onto it, it just doesn't do anything but create anxiety, uh, judgment, classification. Most of those things don't lead to good ends. So I know you spoke about this a little bit, bit and I'm wondering if you can elaborate further. So, you know, many of our, our listeners are either students, prospective students or practitioners. And I'm wondering if you could help to add to a, the discourse here about what are the implications of fat phobia, fat bias, weight bias, weight stigma um, in practice. So just for an example, social workers exist in schools, as school social workers, um, medical social workers, you know, social workers are managers in various settings. Um, making hiring decisions, social workers, you know, um, make decisions about which children um, need to be removed from um, homes due to um, safety issues. You know, we do a lot of things, right? So I'm wondering, I know that you're not specifically in the field um, of social work, but if you can give some of your insights on what are the implications of weight bias, weight stigma for a practitioner? That's such a good question. I, I don't think I think social work is also made so invisible in our society uh, and it is so behind the scenes in so many different ways. Like I, I started my career in schools, working in middle schools and before that Head Start schools and social workers were ever present. Um, but you might not know as a teacher, you might not know who that person was. They might just come to get a student or be working with, you wouldn't know, they could be an occupational therapist. They could be, uh, they could be anyone, especially in schools where I worked where there was a high population of students with a, a lot of divergent needs. Um, you never knew who the adult was who was coming to take a, a child out of the classroom, which looking back on it now has its own set of implications and, and problems. But um, so there are lots of micro decisions that are being made by this person and macro decisions that are being made by this person who you may not know uh, as a person, as a child or as a person uh, who's interacting with that child's life. Um, I think of weight stigma. So if you were to like have watercolor paper or paper and you had watercolors and you were to, you know, put a little bit of a paint here, put a little paint here, put a little paint here, they blend and they would all kind of converge. So I think of weight stigma as a drop of watercolor. I think of racism as a drop of watercolor. I think of uh, sizes, I'm sorry, not sizes, sexism as a kind of um, dot. I think of classism and elitism as a kind of dot. And so those things all converge and collude and interact with each other. I think in particular in the social work field, what we know there is in general, a population of workers that do not match the population they're serving in terms of race, gender, background, uh, economic background, so on and so forth. We have to be even more aware of the isms and things that are intersecting in our minds and in our perceptions of people so that we don't project our own stuff onto people. Um, and I'll use an example. So for me, I'm a, a fat black woman, grew up, um, working, poor working class, now um, middle class, upwardly mobile. I can't separate the parts of myself that are black from the parts of myself that are women, from the parts of myself that are fat, so on and so forth, right? I think as practitioners, um, weight bias intersects a lot with racism. It intersects a lot with um, what we might think of in the sociological world, the, wor the word that we might use is something called a controlling image. So a controlling image is something that's above a stereotype. It's an image that's so pervasive that it kind of codes and shapes how we react to things. So some of the most pervasive controlling images in our society are around and centered around the black body. So there's one that's the Jezebel, that's the hypersexualized black female body, um, a really big butt, a big breast, so on and so forth, like a hypersexualized black body. 
that controlling image was used to control Black women's sexuality and also to justify the continual rape and abuse, sexual abuse of Black women, right? It's like they were Jezebels for asking for it. There's the sapphire, kind of the sassy, Black, argumentative Black woman um, that was also very, very prevalent pre and uh, pre slave, I'm sorry, during slavery uh, and then after slavery that was used to. Um, I think advance this idea that black women were less than not necessarily to say anything about black women, but really to carve out the space for white women to say white women are demure, they're passive, they're sweet, they're kind, they're docile. Um, when in fact, white women had a big role in the horrors of slavery and maintaining the systems of slavery and cruelty of that um, in their households. It was a space to make it so that black women were carved out as se separate and different and distinct, uh, almost different species from a white woman. And so, um, those body, like the, the archetype, those, so when you see a black woman's body and it is a big body, right? There is something going on in your mind and in your person that is anciently coded into you through our society that you have to be aware of happening. So if someone, and also we are, co we are oftentimes, um, I think programmed to see what some community, what some people would express as a passionate place we're coded to see that as anger, right? So when we see passion, when we see distress, when we see frustration and we read it as anger and it's coming from a fat black woman, we read that as anger, we read that as aggression, we read that as unsafety. We can go down a really scary road really quickly. We also, when we know that fat people are seen as less intelligent, um, less hardworking, all those things, Think about how that relates to someone deciding if a home is a safe place. If there's a fat black woman, a fat black matriarch at that at the helm of that household, who also is unemployed, how quickly we can go to the places to say, oh, this is a function of their person, of their personage, and not a function of the conditions that would lead to this being the outcome. And or a person could be in that space and be brilliant. They could be in that space and have a lot of needs that are not being fully met. Um, that are not being fully met by the conditions in which they live. So like, how are we, how are we aware of the, the different codes that are coming at us, that are being pushed at us historically, societally, culturally, so that we don't put those onto, project those onto our clients and the people we inter interact with. Um, and I think sometimes it's, it's, it's gotta be a process of mind work. Like when I see myself assuming that someone is aggressive, what are the other explanations I can come up with? If I see a fat black person and um, I'm coded through society or through the way I was raised in both and to see that person as less intelligent or less deserving of my time, energy of understanding. How can I sit back and be open to seeing this person as a true standalone human and individual who is in a very complex set of conditions? Um, and I don't think, I think if we go on and say, oh, I'm just a, I think what in caring professions, right? Like as an educator, for me as an educator, for um, social workers and caring professions, it can also just be like, I don't care about the person, I'm just here to help, but we have to care about the person. We have to understand that person's social location. We have to understand our social location uh, in order to know what we might be putting onto them uh, and what we might be animating onto the situation that they're in, as opposed to what is actually fact, what is actually going on. That's, that's such good um, content there, you know, and I think, you know, as an educators of, of social workers, part of what I am always challenging and reminding social work students to do is to be engaged in reflexive practice. Right. So that is, you know, get the old school journal out if you need to, but you can also use your phone and write down notes. But thinking about like, so I'm saying this to everyone, you know, listening to me right now, um, even if you don't feel like you have weight bias. You know, I think this is a great time for you to sit down and, 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 and write about what you believe about your body size and what you what practices you engage with your own weight maintenance. Um, you know, if you gain weight, how do you feel? If you lose weight, how do you feel? And all of those feelings, right? So take the time to think about your thinking, right? That metacognition and think about what your internal beliefs are about your own weight and how you make sense of the world and therefore how you then make sense of other people's weight, right? Because it's one thing when we have narratives about ourselves, it's another thing when you're so unaware about your own narrative that you projected on others, as Bren was saying. And that's a huge deal for us as practitioners, those who are making decisions for people's families, right? Like you're making hiring decisions, to what extent 
have you made a decision about somebody's ability to be great, a great employee based on their size, the way that they're showing up, you know, in, um, in the room, um, in your office. And so, you know, as was discussed, this is why we see that weight bias is pervasive was one, because it's accepted in society. You still see, you know, when I look at, when I watch movies from like the early, late nineties, I see a lot of um, shaming uh, um, around sexuality, like yep. LGBT community. I see it less today, but the thing that I continue to see is shaming around size, shaming around, right? Like this weight bias and we continue to allow it to happen. And so it's a part of the water that we swim in, right? The air that we breathe. And so you may say, well, you know, I'm not biased at all, right? I would never shame somebody for their size, but you probably do and you're unaware. And so this is why we're having this session. A hundred percent. And I love that idea of metacognition. Like even if you don't have weight bias, society does. Even if you don't, mm-hmm. even if you're not racist, society is. Yes. So how just I think assume that it is happening <laughs> and then uh kind of work backwards from there. Um I really, really like that. I love that, Dr. Joseph. Thank you. I think Eva had some questions for you. Yeah, so that's actually the perfect segue for my question for you, Bren, because you've touched on it. You've given us so many nuggets of gold on and throughout this whole conversation, but can you talk us through like, how is fat phobia a social justice issue? And I think you touched on it by saying, you know, the system is racist, is sexist, is fat phobic. So where does that, where does it happen? Where is the fat phobia happening? Where can we track it down? Um, (laughs) Show us the receipt. (laughs) Um, this is a really great question. So I think I've talked about it a little bit in the workplace. So part of it is perception. So we know that most systems of oppression are at the personal level. So what do I think? What do I think about myself? What do I think about others? So on and so forth. At the interpersonal level, how do I think about others? How do I treat others? Um, then they're at the kind of community level and then they're at the systems and structures level. So um, first, I would say fat phobia is ever present in our media. So what we're consuming, I think to Dr. Joseph's point, what we're consuming tacitly or explicitly is always telling us what the preferred and good body is. Um, and I think that there's goalposts, right? Like it changes. I, I was watching a film, um, not a film. I was watching the show. Oh, I can't even remember what it was now. I was watching something and the women on the show, it was Sex and the City. I was watching early Sex and the City, which we have to put that to the side for a second because, oh my goodness, um, the layers of issues in Sex and the City. But uh, the women on the show were so thin um, and it was kind of jarring to see because I hadn't really um, seen like women that thin on a show in a while. Uh, and And especially when I think about during the different times uh, when Carrie Bradshaw, who's played by Sarah Jessica Parker, um, goes through different weight fluctuations on the show. And there's some seasons where you can, you know, kind of see her breastplate, you know, her, her breastbone. And, uh, and I just remember being so struck by that because I haven't seen that uh, in a long time. And I don't see it in my personal life too often. Um, but we don't see that kind of body nearly as much in TV and the media and things anymore, unless you are someone who like me follows like fashion or couture things like that you don't see that body as much that body is made um less of the public image of what the perfect body is um where we continue to see fat phobia uh even though our body what our ideal body is has changed and shifted i think about someone like megan the stallion uh who is this kind of ideal idealized body that just doesn't even seem like in this world um that's shifted right so the body is still a thin body right she has a relatively flat stomach she has really not a lot of um, cellulite or visible, um, visible loose skin or, or uh, what, like I guess kind of um, mass fat across her body, like fat amassed across her body, but she has a larger butt and larger rest. Like that is sort of what is now in the body politic as what is the acceptable body, right? Um, at the same time, fat phobia, fat phobia doesn't just discriminate against bodies of uh, equally, so I, let, let me say that again. Fat phobia doesn't equally target all bodies. So two people may be the same weight, but they may carry their weight in different ways. 
that makes one more societally acceptable and makes one less societally acceptable. When we talk about this, I mean, Megan and I, Megan in particular, I've learned so much from, from you and from the podcast. Um, we talk about how there's more acceptable fat bodies than there are others. So I think even when we think about fat phobia as um, a kind of measure of how do people, what is the ideal body, the size eights in the world of Instagram and that influencer community gets to kind of co-op the curvy movement while there still isn't a space, there isn't a store that a size 30 person can walk into right now, an in-person store and go buy clothes. For the most part, I can't think of one even in middle Tennessee where a size 30 person could walk in and experience that. So fat phobia is not just what is in our minds, but it's also what's made available to us and also what we are seen as deserving. So uh, what's made available to us in terms of, I feel like if you can go into anywhere and find pants that fit you, you're probably in a preferred body category or a privileged body category. Um, so it happens in what's available to us. It happens in terms of where we can sit and where we're comfortable. So we talked at the top of the show about the, these, this horrible chair that keeps getting popped up in fancy restaurants uh, that is very, very size exclusive. Um, chairs with arms, things like that. Um, bench, bench seating or seating where the table is really close to the bench because there's a presumption that someone's stomach won't extend past a certain point uh, and be, you know, pained or, or compressed by the table. So it's 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 what we can access, uh, and it's also what people believe that we are um, deserving of. So I think, you know, I've just started dating again recently, uh, and oh my God, the messages that I get as a fat woman, not just a fat woman, but a fat black woman who has like larger breasts and has a more societally accepted body type, I think in some ways, even being on the bigger end of um, what is acceptably fat. Um, the messages I get versus the messages my thin white friends get as the opening message from specifically cis het men, night and day, like overwhelmingly sexual, overwhelmingly rooted in my body, overwhelmingly they're on uh chapter four when they should be on the table of contents like yes. mate I do not know you the way you are talking to me um and also just presumptions of sexuality that my like who's deserving of courtship even right. um and I think in our dating economy we don't see fat women as deserving of courtship and that's reflected in our media um we see fat women Fat women also have to overperform feminist and sexuality to not be considered quote unquote frumpy, uh, which would make them not acceptable to date and less deserving of courtship, less deserving of love, less deserving of care. And then finally, there's this kind of big things of like fat people are less likely to get promoted, fat people are more likely to be paid less than their thinner peers, fat people are less likely to be seen as um, credible experts on their field. We don't have fat figures of that people that we look up to for the most part think of it about how Adele Adele we always looked up to Adele for her talent and uh, she's always been stylish I think the Adele cat eye was probably the most popular YouTube video of <laughs> 2010 um, or maybe it was like 2012 um, so she's always been that person but there's something different happening now and I'm seeing new people that were not interested in Adele before all of a sudden, like paying attention to Adele, more high fashion blogs, things like that, that really kind of wrote her off. Um, like great music, great hair, great eyes, um, but not really looking at her clothes, not really thinking of her as an actual person, just a kind of disembodied voice with cat eye uh, eyeliner. Um, not really seeing her as a, an actual person. And it's so, it's so pervasive, it's hard to even say where is it? Because once you start to think about, well, what accounts am I following? what like do I shop at places that even have a size beyond a 14 once you start to untangle it's like racism right like once yeah. you start to unbundle weight bias and fat phobia it is truly everywhere um right. last example and I swear I'll move on I was talking to <laughs> someone about buying an office chair and it is so hard to find an office chair like I mean most people most straight sides people never think about this I have to look at weight limits when I buy furniture like I want to know one, if I buy a couch, it can't be too low to the ground because my God, I can't do a squat every time I get off this couch. Two, if I'm buying office, if I'm buying furniture that I'm going to be sitting on throughout the day, it needs to have a certain weight capacity. It is really, really hard to find an office chair that is accommodating to people who are super fats or infinite fats. 
Um, it is very hard to find an office chair that actually is certified beyond like 225 pounds, which I would say, I don't know what the average American weighs, but if the average American woman is a 16 or an 18, that's probably in that range. Um, so it's one of those things that is just like, even our, the chairs that we sit in every day have weight stigma built into them. Like the people building these things are not testing it on bigger bodies. Um, so yeah, anyhow, it goes on and on and on. I mean, I do have to put on a gown at the doctor's office. Is it made for your body? No. Do you have to like, if you ever get a tattoo and it's on a big surface area, does someone consider that like you're going to need more ink? No. These are all things that come up again and again and again. Basically, once you start to look for it, it's everywhere. Right, exactly. Thank you so much for your input on that, because this is truly an issue um, that social workers need to be paying attention to. And so um, I hope that we have social workers listening now. We'll be listening later. And don't forget that Bryn, Bryn, just, Bryn just put you on to some dating game. And that is do not roll up into her inbox or another woman, right? And engaging them based on their size. Like, get like to, what is this? Do you what is that? Sense? Well, I right. think this is interesting because what you there on two levels. It's like the experience that other people it's like that's people putting their stuff on yep. you. Like yep. inherently, your body as a woman of color, as a black woman, and as someone with a body who's that's not, like that's what we say. Like this, the white thin blank page of like, I, and I hate to be like, oh yeah. But that's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. That's you're allowed to to be whoever you want to be as a thin white woman. And inherently, when you are a black woman and someone in a larger body, like that society has the information that we've that's been pumping out at us, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves from the jump. But I did something that you said about the Adele situation, really, and I hate to like use Adele as any sort of like she's a woman whatever she has her experience she did she's doing what she's doing but even the way that the industry capitalism system is treating her now as oh, night and day. the music that she's putting out the sound that she has it's much more sexualized and it's much more like sexy music and that's because now she's viable and sexy and yes. that's changed well, it feels like overnight, but it's yeah. not really, like, that's the experience of it. So I feel like that's a prime example of like the capitalist system and what it does to a hundred percent. And she has said so little about her body change. Like, of course, I think intent, I, I'm certain intentionally because she doesn't, it's, she has to be so clear on that. And, um, and I think in, in, in so many other fat celebrities who've lost weight, there's just this kind of guarding that you have to do. Because I also think that when you're fat, you are inherently up for public consumption. Like people right. see themselves as being more entitled to know about your body and to know things about your body uh, and to have opinions about your body. I think I, I said in my Instagram post a while ago, like some people get dressed, everybody has to get dressed, but some people get dressed and it's everybody's business. Um, and that's how fat people, like it's not just what fat people do because we exist in a society and it's all the different projections and weird stuff that people put on you. Um, and it is, I mean, I have a friend who says uh, his like go-to phrase when something feels weird is, oh, that's not us, that's transference or that's not us, that's projection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I feel that way sometimes. I feel like I'm just gonna start sending that to people. It's like, you're actually projecting something onto me that I haven't uh, consented to. So think about that. Maybe go read a dang book. Uh, I'm like anything, please, so you can be more educated on this. That's all such a good point. And something that I thought about when you were talking, Bren, was um, accessibility as far as when we're, when we're thinking about chairs in these hip restaurants that we want to go to, when we're thinking about going to get our yearly checkup and having to put on a robe where it doesn't really fit. Um, it tells us who is allowed to be in public spaces. Yeah. And in, in a similar way to um, not having nine non-binary bathrooms or um, homeless people, you know, like having separators and benches so that homeless people can't or unhoused people can't lay down in public spaces. It's just a way to gatekeep whose humanity is allowed to be in public spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really, that has a lot of implications on social work. Something that I want to 
um, ask you about is, so Eva and I are on a clinical track, meaning that we're going to be psychotherapists, hopefully, when we graduate. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in that uh, sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship as social workers, um, there's a difference, right, between body image work and body liber liberation work. And so what I'm curious about is as a therapist, is promoting intentional weight loss ethical? Is upholding a person, a client's goal of intentional weight loss, is that ethical? And that's a big question. Megan and Eva, my goodness gracious. I'm, first of all, I'm glad y'all are the kind of people who are gonna be psychotherapists because we need y'all. Um, that is such a good question. I guess it's, it's part of it is what is our role as practitioners who are helping people get more quote unquote healthy, whatever healthy means to them. I think if someone were to say, oh, you know, I want to lose weight. So I'm going to smoke 10 cigarettes a day. And I'm going to smoke anytime I feel hungry, um, which some people do as a weight loss, like the very valid form of weight management, uh, valid in the sense that it's, I don't know, it works for those people, quote unquote works. Um, I think as a, as a practitioner, it would be in your lane to say, well, I think if you're introducing some behaviors that we know have negative health consequences in order to achieve this goal, let's understand and unpack that. Like my role is to help you understand, it's not just to meet your goals, but it's to help you to understand your goals and why you want those goals. And also it's kind of that meta work, but I'm going to keep coming back. I'm, I'm so glad you used the word meta today because now it's going to be my word of the day. But it's like on paper, our job is to help them determine goals help them to determine their pathways to meet those goals. That is the stated purpose of what we're there to do. But if we're not doing the work of unpacking, why is this your goal? Why is this meaningful to you? Um, what are your support systems to achieve this goal? So on, it's what informs this goal, then I think we're leaving our clients kind of holding the bag um, because yes, they might achieve those goals, but will they understand themselves anymore? Will they understand their, their systems more? Will they understand their programming more? Potentially no. They might in the pursuit of those goals learn things. They will learn things in the pursuit of those goals. But if you have some kind of knowledge about what is and isn't helpful behavior or what is chasing the tail, like chasing the dragon um, and not actually gonna lead to a helpful outcome, then I think it's our responsibility as practitioners to tell people that. So like for me, there's a totally different corollary, but one of the things I often find myself doing is I talk to entrepreneurs every day who are growing businesses and uh, sometimes they'll come to me and they'll say, I really need investment and I need like probably 50K to 100K investment, which in the big world of investment is not a crazy sum, not a wild sum, but it is a wild sum if you need it. And it's a wild sum for someone like me and to most of the founders who, are, who I talk to. Um, and sometimes I have to tell them, you know, sometimes I'm, I'll say that goal is an awesome goal. Here's how we can make a pathway to achieve it. And sometimes I'll tell them, I'm looking at what you want to achieve and I'm actually going to counsel you away from taking on investment because I actually see a pathway for you to do this without taking on investors or deleting your ownership. I see a pathway for you to do this without taking on debt, or maybe you could take on debt capital that's much less risky at a zero to one percent interest rate. I see other pathways to achieving what you want to do. Is, it, is what you want to do to live a life where you feel more healthy, where you feel like you can do more things with your body than you could do six months ago? There's a lot of ways to achieve that that aren't rooted in weight. So let's talk about what are some other things we can do to achieve this goal. Let me understand what you want to be different about your life by achieving this goal. If you think your life will be materially different, if you achieve a hundred pounds, tell me how, uh, if you achieve losing a hundred pounds, if you think your life will be materially different, if you, you know, get into a size 10, tell me how, and tell me some other ways we can achieve that. What is the nuance and what's tricky is that, you know, if someone came to me and said, oh, I don't want to be black anymore because being black means you'll face persecution and all that kind of stuff. I'd be like, that is valid. Uh, and also I don't think a pathway to it is hating your black skin because that's that's going to be a real bad road. You're going to have to do a lot of things. Skin bleaching is not cute, you know, all that kind of stuff. You're going to have to do a lot of things to achieve that that are actually not going to be helpful for you. I think with people who are wanting to lose weight, it's like, do you actually want to lose weight or do you not want to face societal stigma for being in your body? And none of us want to wait, want to face societal stigma for being in our bodies. So then what is the work that we can do to make it so that we experience less societal stigma, right? Um, 
what is the work that we can do to experience less societal stigma and also be more in our bodies and have a less combative relationship with our bodies. Um, getting to a place where our body is our first home and we can feel any way about it that we want to. Um, there are days when I look around this house and I'm like, why is it such a mess? Why is it like this? And then I have to remind myself, oh, I have a roof over my head. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to love my house every minute of every day. I don't have to love my body every minute of every day, but it is my primary way of engaging with the world for the most part. And that is something that I really want to root in and ground in for anyone who's faced, anyone, everyone who has a body. Um, but in particular, people who have bodies that are stigmatized. Like, I want you to not face weight stigma too. But I don't think losing weight is the pathway that you think it is. Um, it may provide some short-term amelioration of this. That's true. Or you might get to a, a size where you're more able to advocate. That's possible. But also, we know there's no scientifically valid way to lose weight. They haven't found one yet. Uh, that is a scientific pathway to losing weight that doesn't have negative consequences. So I don't know if I want to send someone down that road especially if I know that as a practitioner, it's like, I actually know there's been no study that has found there is a predictable pathway to lose weight that results in positive, like universally positive outcomes and achieving the goal. If I, if I know that and I don't share that with my client, I feel like that is uh, potentially unethical. So no, I wouldn't counsel them to lose weight, but I would also say, I love that you wanna, you have a goal that matters to you. Let's talk about why you have this goal uh, and then unbundle that a little bit. Can I just jump in to say like that makes so much sense to me because, you know, I've been on different like weight loss journeys and one way of losing weight worked for my body at one season and then it didn't work for my body in another season. And all of it is about being responsive to your body or your mental health, your needs are changing and your growing body that's been serving you for umpteen years. Right. And so they're like, Woo. I appreciate what you said, because there's not one way of losing weight for everybody, right? Um, so that makes so much sense. And sorry to <laughs> jump in, Megan, but one thing I feel like I want to say here, though, is people who lose weight and they say, oh, my gosh, it confirmed my greatest fear, because now everyone's like, oh, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful, or whatever these compliments are. And it's like, but I was before. Hello. <laughs> yeah, hello. It's like, you are being weird to me. <laughs> like, you are being really weird. And I also think in this season of people going home, people visiting family, food is such a, um, a powerful uniter and, and tradition uh, builder, but it's also one of those things that is uh, very, very loaded for so many of us. I think in this time, um, it can be a really helpful time to model how we want people to talk about bodies in the new age. And I think that's something that we're probably all thinking about is how do I live in this world as it exists today? while also making pushes to live in the world I want to live in. Like I have to have a vision for the world I wanna live in to exist in this world today um, and to remind myself that this isn't the way it's always going to be. BMI didn't exist 250 years ago. I don't think in 250 years it'll be in use, right? Um, I don't think in 50 years it'll be in use, like cross your fingers, we'll see. Um, there was actually just like a World Health, Health Organization um, push to kind of unbundle BMI and to talk more about the negative impacts of weight bias on health. So there is something happening in the, in the international sphere that could potentially change things. But all that to say, I think this is a good time of year to model things like, I would actually prefer we not talk about my body. Um, can we actually not talk about my body? Or to say things like, when you talk about your body like that, it's actually hard for me uh, to hear. Or can you know, I've noticed that when we talk about food, you use a lot of language, like you say things like, oh, I'm good, I'm bad, or this and that, like, what if food can just be food? Like, these are times to say those things. Um, and to also just monitor in ourselves, like, how does it feel to be around our people um, when they say these things? And if it doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel safe with the amount of any kind of stigma you face when you're in your quote unquote home or the or love the people that raised you, like, build a new home, build a new place where people, you know, build a new family, build a new space where um, that is more reflective of the world that you hope to live in one day, as opposed to the world that you came from. Um, I, I, yeah, it's just, it's just a really, really strange time to be in a body, <laughs> especially in a fat body. I think about this all the time, like, 
Lizzo, unfortunately, the war of bodies being waged over her body all the time. <laughs> like, I feel like she is the site of the body, the body image wars. Um, but I feel like I see her even pushing towards what Megan mentioned, this idea of body liberation. It's just like, stop worrying about my body. It is just a body. Everybody has a body until we get to a place where we can be disembodied consciousnesses uploaded to a robot. Everybody's going to have a body and be cool about like, just literally be cool. Just be chill, calm down. Don't worry about my smoothie cleanse. What I do over here. I didn't tell anyone it was to lose weight. I didn't tell anyone why I did it. I just wanted to do a smoothie cleanse. She says, now what I do a smoothie cleanse. No, because I like to chew food. Um, it makes me feel full, but uh, were there times in my life where I was like, I really want a green smoothie. I want to go drink a green smoothie right now. Heck yeah, turn up truck here in town. It was an amazing pineapple express smoothie. Uh, and there are times when I want to go drink and eat that and not have someone be like, oh my God, good on you for drinking a smoothie. Like if someone comments this, anywho, there's so much, it happens so often and people just feel very entitled to comment on the bodies of fat people um, and comment on the bodies that they feel ownership over. And I think that's the other part of this family time is like, people still feel ownership over our bodies. The people that birthed us and spring us feel ownership over our bodies in a way that probably feels really dissonant when you come home versus how you live in the world when you're away from your family. Um, so anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna step down from my little soapbox for a second. <laughs> no, no, we don't want you to. We want you to stay here. <laughs> I was getting heated um, there for a second. I had to take a sip of water. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're almost out of time, but a couple of things that I, want to highlight is um, as social workers, we're committed to evidence-based practice and research. And so I think it's so important that you pointed out that there just aren't any studies showing that um, intentional weight loss is effective or leads to positive health outcomes. In fact, it often leads to negative health outcomes. Do your research, you can look it up. Um, also, I think this conversation, or, you know, I, I think it's so important to frame it as, okay, why is this a social justice issue? And then going forward, I hope that we can all think about what microaggressions look like against fat people. We've sort of started to talk about that when people are talking about our bodies, when they're moralizing food. Um, I think that would be an interesting conversation going forward, maybe. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say thank you so much. And because this is a uh, mental health program that we're involved in, I was wondering if you would just talk about your business. That is uh, so oh, I definitely can. Yeah, I definitely can. Um, also, I will say just before we end, it's been my pleasure to be here, Megan. I'm so honored that you thought of me. Um, Dr. Joseph, it's been great getting to know you, Eva. It's been great getting to know you as well. Um, and uh, my very best friend is a, a social work, runs a social work program here in town. And I just learned so much from her. So I'm, I'm grateful to get to be in this world. Um, I have a small business called Disocialite Design Co. So imagine the word socialite with the, with the letters D-I-S in front of it. It's a combination word of dissociate and socialite. Um, and I started it during COVID because I was on a call with a friend and she was like, people keep giving me all these extra to do's and I need them to understand that I am depressed. <laughs> like girl, I'm depressed. Um, and I was like, I wish you could just put that, you know, a badge on or a shirt on so that people knew not to over assign you things or that you might be in a little fragile state just so they could be primed so you didn't have to tell them. And uh, that's how it started. So I started a, a clothing and it's apparel and it's uh, stationary goods that focuses on mental health um, and just more broadly kind of the phenomena of being alive. Um, what are different things that we might experience? Sometimes I'll make a little something based on like something very sharp. My therapist might've said that really stuck with me or just things that I think throughout the day. So um, anxious is one that's a very popular sweatshirt this time of year, depressed is another one, uh, dissociating, catastrophizing. Um, one of my really big sellers lately has been um, a shirt and a print that says Saddy Daddy. Um, so anywho, I think part of it is sort of uh, destigmatizing these ideas, but also providing mass, like mass access to these phenomena. I think well, for me, when I learned what the phenomenon of dissociating was, it made my whole life come into context. All of a sudden, um, everything came into focus for me. And so um, I hate that I had to learn about that at 32 in, in therapy, which is super inaccessible, but I want more people to learn about things in a more mass way. It, and, I think this is part of that conversation as well, as in addition to all the amazing work that's happening on social media right now around mental health and um, clinical, clinical workers in the mental health profession. 
Great, great. Well, thank you for your time, Bryn. We have learned so much. This has just been such a hearty conversation. Um, as we discussed in the beginning, that this is a topic that's often under discussed, and we want to be a part of the work that brings it to the helps to bring it to the forefront. So I, I appreciate the work that you're already doing in this regard. I thank you, Megan, for um, introducing us to Bryn and already doing work in this regard and preparing yourself um, to, to go into practice to be able to better serve our communities. And um, Eva, thank you for all the work that you've done to help to get us organized for day today as well. And so with that said, we're going to close out. We thank you everyone for listening to our newest and latest episode of the Social Justice Podcast. We will continue to bring more great and relevant information.